Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great honor and privilege to welcome Dr. Mina J. Bissell, distinguished scientist from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, to deliver today's Walls Lecture. Dr. Bissell grew up in an environment where her curiosity was encouraged from a very young age. She left her home in Iran to come to college in the US to study chemistry at Radcliffe. Then she pursued her PhD in bacterial genetics at Harvard University, followed by fellowships at both Harvard and UC Berkeley, then finally joining uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs as a staff biochemist. She climbed through the ranks to become a senior scientist just five years later, and then was later appointed director of cell and molecular uh, biology division, and later director of all life sciences. Upon stepping down as director, she was given the title Distinguished Scientist. To say that Dr. Bissell is an extremely accomplished scientist is an understatement. She has authored over 300 publications, holds at least five US patents, and serves on over a dozen editorial boards, including for Science Magazine. And she has served the science community for her entire career in various uh, positions such as president of the ASCB, and she served as a member of the AACR Educational and Scientific Advisory Boards, as well as the Human right, Rights Committee of the National Academies, as well as numerous other committees. Her remarkable career has been recognized through numerous awards, such as the Medal for the Top High School Student in Iran, the Top t Chemistry Student at Radcliffe College, uh, the Exceptional Service Award from the US Department of Energy, and finally, election to the National Academies of Sciences in 2010. Remarkably, the University of Porto has created an award named the Mina J. Bissell Award to be given out biannually to a person who has changed his or her field. Fittingly, Dr. Bissell was the first one to receive this award. Her work focusing on the extracellular matrix of the microenvironment and breast tissue has truly revolutionized cancer biology. Over 30 years ago, Dr. Bissell began to champion the idea that cancer simply isn't tumor cell-centric or oncogene-centric, but rather that the microenvironment plays an important role in driving cancer. Her hypothesis regarding dynamic reciprocity or communication influence between tumor cells in their microenvironment was not widely accepted at first, but she persevered in her studies and eventually won acceptance for her ideas through strong experimental evidence. Dr. Bissell's groundbreaking studies indicate a cancerous phenotype can be reverted to a non-transformed phenotype, depending on the local tissue environment. Combined, Dr. Bissell's work has directly impacted the scientific community by encouraging all scientists to think more broadly about our work, to consider not only individual cells, but the surrounding tissue. In other words, not just tumor cells, but also their microenvironment. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mina J. Bissell. Well, I am delighted to be here. Can you hear me? Um, any of you who heard me last year in another huge auditorium at NIH, uh, you can go to sleep for the next half an hour. <laughs> I was told that I have to give a much more broad talk. I was ordered by, the, by Dr. Gottesman here. And uh, so I had to change my talk in the last hour mainly going back to what I did last year, so I apologize. But I think many of the kids here had not heard me, and uh, in order for me to be able to tell you something that is still not in your textbooks and should have been, I have to give you the background so you can see why I did what I did. And thank you so much, Kara, for this lovely introduction. And you already gave them the bottom line of my talk, which is perfectly good. Now, uh, can I have more light a bit on the audience and a tiny bit less light here? It's all right if you can't do it, but if you could, it would be lovely. So let's see if I can do it. Oh, boy. Okay, I have a lot to tell you, partly because I think you need to hear this story. 
to hear this story from the beginning about why I did what I did. You just heard that I was a chemist and then a bacterial geneticist, and I came to uh, do a postdoc, and I, uh, in cancer biology or cancer virology, and things didn't make sense to me. So I decided that I needed to think about a big, huge question like this. Now, some people say you have 10 trillion cells. Some people say you have 70 trillion cells. I don't know who counted them. But the point is that you have more than the national debt of US. <laughs> Every one of these cells have the same genetic material. Think about it. 10 trillion cells, everyone with the same genetic material. So you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, and the prostate, so the guys would listen, and how did they become what they are? And how do they remember to be what they are? These are really, really fundamental questions in biology. They are questions of complexity, and they are the question that makes biology so interesting. So I will show you, I will show you only two slides that many of you who have heard me have, heard, have seen it for 30 years. And that's starting with this. This is RAS sarcoma virus. It makes this ugly tumor in the chicken. Uh, RAS uh, did it in 1911, won the Nobel Prize 50 years later. I tell the students, hang in there, it may come. But the point is that when this virus was discovered, it was the first oncogenic virus, people made a filtrate. And they dumped the filtrate on the cells in tissue culture dish. They would make a little bump. And they would say, this is normal, this is malignant. And I tell you, it did not make sense to me. You have 10 trillion cells, and if there is there a single gene that could make you malignant, what could happen is that you would be having tumor, 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 tumor all over you, and you don't. If you take even the smallest statistical chance of the mutations, all of us get when we breed, when we eat, when we go out in the sunshine, you should have many more tumors than you actually get. Now, I wrote a review, and I'm not going to talk about this. The review is called, Why Do We Get So Few Cancers? Everybody says, oh, there is an epidemic of cancer. My statement is, why do we get so few cancers? And it just came out in Nature Medicine. So for those, I was going to talk a lot about that, and I was going to give you a whole lot of other things, but now I'm giving you just the history of how I arrived at this. So for those of you who are interested, it addresses the title of the talk, which, by the way, I didn't give. I don't know who came up with it. But, but I do say that the reason we don't get so many tumors is because the microenvironment actually keeps us intact. And you could have mutation and mutation until you're blue in the face, and you will not get tumor unless the structure of the tissue that you're talking about is gone. So let me see if I can convince you of that. So in this case, when I had my own lab, we took chick embryos, and because of some literature, we did a quick experiment which took us, of course, two and a half years to even learn to do, because we had to inject into the chicken embryo. We took the virus, this virus, that is causing such an ugly tumor, and we put it in the chicken embryo. It didn't make any tumors. It expressed PP60 SARC. It had the oncogene. It would not make tumors. So we published this in Nature in 1984, and you can imagine it didn't make any ripples whatsoever. The evidence that oncogenes were there, they were so exciting, they were so dominant, they were so strong, was so high that it just couldn't be conceivable if somebody says a single oncogene is not enough. So we had to do even more. A few years later, we took the gene of a RAS sarcoma virus called PP60 SARC, we put it in the chick embryo, and as you see here in this very beautiful feather, uh, like Z, attached to PP60 SARC, you see every one of those um, little blue cells 
could be a tumor, and they're not. The embryo ha incorporates the oncogene just as fine until the embryo is about to hatch. And when the embryo is, a start, is beginning to hatch, it falls apart. So what is doing it in the chicken giving it a tumor? In the embryo, it doesn't give it a tumor. If we took that wing, dissociated it, and put it in a dish, overnight we get a pileup of transformed cells that are all blue, right? So in a dish, you get that. In the chicken, you get the tumor. In the embryo, you have the embryo. So what does that tell you? What it told me is the following. That context, i.e. the microenvironment, determines even what a potent oncogene can do. Then the question was, how does context signal? And this wasn't a concept that was out there to think about how this happens. Now, I will very quickly go over what we had to do. We began to think that the time has come to take on these very important and large questions. How is tissue specificity maintained, i.e., fingerness, noseness, elbowness? How is it maintained? How is it arrived at? How is it maintained? Of course, developmental biologists say, how is it arrived at? Cell biologists said, how is it maintained? How does one study the problem in mammals? The number of times I wish dorsal fila had mammary gland, I can't tell you it doesn't. I wish it did, or prostate, or whatever for that matter. So how do you study this in mammals? And how is the program lost in cancer and aging? It's precisely when a cell doesn't know that it's supposed to be skin, or liver, or breast, or prostate, that it piles up, goes elsewhere, and loses the ability to be that particular tissue. And finally, how does one use this information for therapy, which is what, after all, NCI is all about? Okay, so we chose the mammary gland, if you will, as an experimental animal, because it's one of the few tissues in the, that, that changes during the adult life of the organism. It goes from virgin to pregnancy to lactation to involution, and then it comes all the way back after the babies are taken away. And, um, and uh, it is also an organism within an organism. So we said, right, we want to know and work on a mammary gland, and we want to know how the mammary gland wants to know how to be a mammary gland. Now, why did we choose mammary gland, and why just that rather than any old thing? Cancer is a tissue-specific disease. When you have liver cancer, you get a very different, you ask any pathologist, they can tell you. You ask any oncologist, they will tell you. They give you different drugs. They give you different treatments. Cancer of the liver is not the same as pancreas, and ovary is not the same as breast. So in order for us to be able to understand these different kinds of cancers, we got to understand that particular tissue or organ. So I have spent 40 years of my life working with mammary cells, working with human, mouse, mammary cells in culture, mammary cells in vivo, etc., and in order to be able to understand it, and every other week, we are having an untold story. We find something new. There is so much we don't know. OK. So here is the mammary gland of the, of the human. It has, um, it has a duct. And it's one of those uh, ductal lobular units here. I don't know if you can see. It's sort of dark on there. Can you see in that corner from there? OK. So you see that it has. Ducts, lobules, asini, it has stem cells, it has this. So if you want to model mammary gland, what do you model? So we decided that the mammary gland itself is complicated, so we said, okay, we are going to model the asini, which are the thing that you form towards the end of pregnancy, uh, to, uh, in the middle of pregnancy, and where, where the cells come together and form that beautiful three-dimensional structure, and when they form it, as you see, it's one layer of epithelial cells, one layer of myoepithelial cells that squeeze the gland, 
and then a layer of what is known as extracellular matrix, these large molecules outside about which I knew nothing when I first started to do this, and I learned a lot from my postdocs, and they were postdocs who taught me about collagen and laminin and all the rest of them. And those things come together and make what is known as a basement membrane, which is around all the glandular tissue. So we said, right, we want to know how this structure knows to do this. We want to know how it knows how to make milk, and we know how it can actually remember to be polar. So we put these cells that are like this, and I wish I could show you the EM pictures, but there is no time because there is so much to tell you. They completely lose function, even in complete medium, with all the lactogenic hormone, with everything you want to give them that you put these cells in culture. In two days, they forget to make milk, they forget to look like that, the shape of nuclei changes, everything about it changes. And you say, my goodness, I put these cells, two days ago they were making these gobs and gobs of milk, what happened? Well, why is that? What is missing? Now remember that question of context that I showed you in those two slides of Ralph sarcoma virus. So we said there has to be a context that is missing in the tissue culture plastic, right? So what is that context? And we, if you look at this section of a mammary gland, you have these acini, you have these lipid droplets, that's where the milk goes, and around it are these large, huge molecules called extracellular matrix, in this case, laminin, laminin-111, a very important component of an of a extracellular matrix or basement membrane. So we said, hey, probably this is missing. So we used to make these tumors in my lab, and, and uh, Hinda Kleinman at, uh, at N NCI, in fact, um, showed the composition of this matrix. It used to be called EHS matrix, and now they sell it. They call it matrigel, and many of you know it. It cost a fortune. And I wish Hinda and I would have patented it. Of course, she couldn't do it being in a government lab, but, um, but we could have gotten really rich. And we could have had a whole lot of things for our science, but in those days, we didn't know how to do this. So you put the cells on the top of this thing, they pull it over them, they organize. In about three or four days, they make this beautiful three-dimensional structure. And this thing is in culture, this thing is in vivo, and even the sizes are the same. So it's very exciting. In about three or four days, you can re recreate the three-dimensional structure of an asinus, show that it makes gobs and gobs of milk, and we ask the question, do they only look good or do they make a lot of milk? They make a lot of milk, and they put it in the lumen, which means that they know which way to secrete it, which means they know the polarity of the tissue. Now, everything about you is polar, everything about you. If it wasn't polar, it wouldn't work. So polarity is a very important component of tissue specificity. And we not only make the tissue, but we also make it to be functionally polar, which is quite exciting. We can make this beautiful structure. For those of you who haven't seen that, I like to blow them up and put them on the wall. And uh, it has a lot of milk. And uh, again, with apologies to you who have seen that, I'm getting up there. I have these big, big birthdays. And so what my kids did was this, right? <laughs> so we have milk and we have a lot of milk, right? So we said, is this applicable to human? So I had this guy come to my lab, Ole Peterson from Denmark. We are still collaborating after about 30 years. And I said, you're an MD, PhD, you have access to a reduction mammoplasty. Why don't you go and get some reduction mammoplasty tissue and let us see if what we did for mouse is applicable to human, so it is. It, this is in the human, in this gobs and gobs of fatty tissue. It's called terminal ductal lobule unit. And when you do that, you, it looks like that. If you dissociate it, put it in a dish, it looks like that, which is what most of you are familiar with if you work with cell culture. This is epithelial cell culture in a gorgeous monolayer, but it looks nothing like that. Now you put it back in this gooey material and look at it, it reorganizes. So we said, this is wonderful, could this, if the normal cells know this, 
could the tumor cells, and you know, we, we get things like that, and we said if the normal cells know how to reorganize in three dimension, would the tumor cells remember if we put them in three dimension to be a tumor? And you know, we do not have an assay. We did not have an assay 30 years ago to distinguish normal and malignant epithelial cells. The only thing we could do was to stick them in the mouse. It would take months and months before we would know if they would make tumors or not. But we used this assay to distinguish normal and malignant cells. And here is the assay. On top are single human cells that are making these beautiful or, or organized structures. And here are the tumor cells, and you see every one of them do it. And it's like having hundreds and thousands of transgenic human breasts or human tumors in a dish. And you can take any one of these, they're all clonal. So you can take them, you can do genetics, you can put genes in them, you can do dominant active, dominant negative, make the libraries, make a screen. I will show you using this way of thinking, we have actually discovered a whole lot of new targets that may explain resistance to drugs. I'm trying to wake up Mike. So here, so we then said, <laughs> so we then said, what are, how is it that we are going to actually understand why the normal cells know and tumor cells don't know? So I didn't want to use normal cells from here and tumor cells from there. So we took these cells again from Ole's laboratory with his professor. They had taken cells from reduction mammoplasty, had put them in a dish, passage, 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 no, no growth factor, no antibiotics, only one growth factor, epidermal growth factor receptor. So somewhere around here, they took the growth factor away, and I came into the picture somewhere here. And when they did that, we kept, they kept injecting it into the mouse, and finally one of these formed tumors, and the tumors could be recycled. So all of a sudden, we have the first model of human breast cancer outside humans. We have it all the way from normal to malignant, and in between, we have all of the different stages. And please note, that we didn't add oncogene, we didn't take away suppressor gene. It took 20 years, but folks, in your body, cancer takes at least that long before it develops. It doesn't do it in two weeks with MMTV, okay? So in order to be able to understand that, you gotta develop a model where they are actually, where the cells become malignant during the process of self, whatever it is they do, okay? Now, if you take those cells, these cells, these cells, and look at them under 2D, they all look the same. You put them in 3D and they sort out, and here I just did them for you. Passage 50, they already have amplification and deletion. Passage 110, MIC gets amplified and God knows whatever. Passage 175, they still form these lovely structures, even though they're a little bit bigger. But when you look at the pre-malignant cells, all of a sudden, we have a phenotype for pre-malignancy, which is quite exciting. They have a lot of deletion, mutation, et cetera, but they are not yet malignant, and that says the structure goes before malignancy sets in. Are you with me? Put your hand up if you want me to repeat something, okay? <laughs> All right. So um, tumor cells, something happens and they become tumor cells. All right, we then said, we want to know why this one knows and this one doesn't. These have a lot of mutation too, so how come they know? All right, so we come up with two crazy ideas. That if the structure is the message, we should be able to take a really frank malignant cell and be able to make it become normal if we fix the structure, okay? Alternatively, if we take a mouse, and mess up the mammary gland, just losing this structure without again giving an oncogene or a suppressor gene, would they get tumors? And we have done both of these. I'm not going to have much time to tell you about the second, maybe just one slide, and what I will tell you a little bit more about the first. So these are the non-malignant, these are the malignant. We looked at the cell surface, Valerie Weaver in those days in my lab, and now she has her own little mini empire at UCSF. She did flow cytophorometry and showed that these cells had all the integrins they have, growth factor, et cetera, but they had it at the wrong balance. They had it at a higher level. They had six times the level of EGFR, five times the level of beta-1 integrin, which are, these integrins are receptors for extracellular matrix, for ECM. So we said, okay, what if 
we came in and used inhibitory antibody against one of these integrins, which is beta-1, something that we knew was quite important, what will happen? And bring the level of beta-1 to the level of this, but not to zero. Just to make it think my level of beta-1 integrin now has come down and is normal. And look what happens. They revert, they stop growing, they are clearly not 100% normal. Again, many of you have seen that, but if you haven't seen it, and it doesn't boggle your mind, I don't know what does. Because here they were, these real malignant cells, and we can actually revert them, and the genome is still completely malignant. And to show you that every one of them do it, here is the movie, um, I apologize for the out of focus. Here are the malignant cells, here are the cells treated with beta-1. Every one of them revert in four days. And now we can do it not inside, but on top, and it takes only four days or three days. We can distinguish them. It's absolutely phenomenal. And we are doing it with beta-1. So we said, this is ridiculous. And people were still not listening to us. They kept saying, you must have a mutation. You must, you must have done selection. And I would say four days, 10 to the seven cells selected. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? It actually would be quite interesting. You, you would have this. But, but clearly, that wasn't the case. So we decided we have to show that, that reversion was reversible. So that's what we did. We took cells without um, uh, antibody, with antibody. We took these cells that had gotten reverted, put them in a, in a flask, and then these cells that were reverted were left without antibody, and they do this with antibody, they do this. And you can do this again and again and again. Can you see that, Michael? So, so the question was, what does this mean? So phenotype is dominant over genotype. I said this in Heidelberg first time, and I thought they'll, they'll shoo me out of the room five, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. They actually didn't, which was good. But you see, it used to shock people that this is the case. But you know, again, if you look at the mirror, you see this, that, that. They have the same genotype and entirely different phenotype. So clearly, phenotype is dominant over genotype, right? OK. So if we take these, these uh, things, these round cells here, and inject them into animals, we get zero tumors if we do them like this. But if we dissociate them and add a little bit of beta-1 inhibitory antibody, then we get 70% reduction in tumors. And Katy Park and I have, uh, is a radiation oncologist, and I have a number of paper in cancer research where we have shown that the beta-1 inhibitory antibody works in the mice, has no toxicity. It absolutely boggles my mind also, but it kills the tumors. So why we shouldn't be using it, I don't know. But if you use a little bit of beta-1 with radiation, you could reduce the level of radiation needed to kill the number of tumor cells and reduce it by 75%. So you can go from 8 gray radiation to 2 gray if you use a little bit of beta-1. So we have two or three papers, and three actually, in cancer research that you can look at about the relevance of what I'm telling you to the in vivo situation and to mice. So growth and malignant behavior are regulated at the level of tissue organization, and they are dependent on extracellular matrix and organization, and I say that if you don't believe us, please Google us. Now, signaling in two dimension and three dimension are entirely different. I wish I could show you a whole lot of other things. The reason for, for thinking about this is that we said we are adding beta-1 inhibitory antibody. EGFR was six-fold higher. The cells stopped growing and organized. What happened to EGFR? So we measured EGFR. When we add beta-1 inhibitory antibody, EGFR goes down. We use inhibitory EGFR, beta-1 goes down. We use PI3 kinase, EGFR and beta-1 go down. Now you do this in two dimension, and that does not happen. They may stop growing, but the level of EGFR and beta-1 don't talk to each other. So signaling is very different in 2D and 3D, right? And here is another example, Coxsackie adenovirus receptor, which you, you know, we put adenovirus in humans for gene therapy. We don't know what exactly regulates it. In 2D, non-malignant, malignant, it needs alpha-V uh, integrin, non-malignant, malignant, identical. 
You put them in 3D. This is non-malignant in 3D, look at it. This is malignant in 3D, it remains high. This is malignant reverted. And you see it looks like the non-malignant, right? And now you see that even in malignant, all of a sudden in 3D, alpha V integrin upregulates. It's not just looking at the arrays. It's actually doing the protein analysis of these things to see how they are regulated and what actually does it. So it says that normal and malignant cells are both, both plastic and dependent on the context and the microenvironment, right? Okay, so now I have done this thing for you. It says beta-1 integrin downmodulates EGFR, MAP kinase, PI3 kinase, AKT. For every one of these, we have a paper. We have notch, taste, RAP1, cyclic AMP, et cetera, et cetera. And so it says that the cell is integrating all these different signals. And by doing the reversion, all we have to do is to knock down one of these pathways and one of these molecules to get them to remember to be organized. Now, in vivo, clearly, if you do that, something else becomes limiting. But in tissue culture, you can do that and at least understand what's the rationale and the plan and the logic of, if you will, asinousness. And you're learning a lot because we have, and as I will show you, we have done a lot of arrays with these different kind of reversion, and we are learning a lot about those molecules that are shared between all of these reverting phenomena. Okay, so form and function are related dynamically and reciprocally. You mess up one, you mess up the other. Now, I said this, and I said that all these pathways have to think, uh, integrate, and I began to think about the studies that I myself did in the 70s, and I began to think about metabolism, which now has become sexy and there are a lot of people who are using it, although uh, when Warburg uh, said that metabolism and glycolysis were important in the 50s and 40s, it went completely out of fashion in the 70s and 80s. So I want to tell you that I asked the question, if I'm right and everything has to integrate, what about metabolism? What happens actually to metabolism, right? So. I am now bringing you to studies I did before you were born, or at least many of you were born. When I first got into the Lawrence Berkeley lab, I was amazed at the way that cell biologists, including myself, um, did their experiment. We open the incubator door, the pH changes, the temperature changes, this changes, that changes. We take the cells, put them under microscope, look at them, put them back, scrape them, and then measure something. We hardly ever do kinetics. We hardly ever think about pH. We hardly ever think about the change in temperature. And I was a bacteriologist, and I knew 0.01 change of pH really changed the whole metabolic pathway, right? So I devised this little machine, which is still in my lab, where we had 30 plates, and you could inject radioactivity from one of these uh, septums. Underneath was constant temperature and pH. And then you could, you could inject radioactivity, turn this thing around, take the cells out without disturbing all the others. So we could do 30 second time point up to 24 hour time point and generate kinetic. So the first thing we observed when we used the technique that Melvin Calvin had used for path of carbon in photosynthesis, and in this huge um, paper chromatogram, we would run them in one direction, and then we would turn them around with phenol. God knows what we got away in those days. And, and the, we realized that the pattern of glucose metabolized, this was really like doing the first system biology 40 years ago. This is all of the glucose metabolites. You can cut them, count them, and then um, do the graph of the kinetic. But the first thing we noticed was that the pattern of glucose metabolites was tissue specific. And everybody was saying that glucose is a housekeeping function. The kind of comments that absolutely drives me nuts, not because they are sexist, but because they really give the right impression to the young students about the fact of what is important and what's not important, right? So, Having done this, we could show that, in fact, the normal were much lower glycolytic than the tumor, even though after Warburg, there was a lot of confusion. 
And when you control for everything, this falls out. So we then wanted to know what was wrong with it. We showed that respiration was not affected. As you know, he said respiration has to be affected. So we conclude that respiration didn't need to be affected. But we did another experiment where I, I excluded everything. And I say I, because in those days I was at the bench. And so I did an experiment and in fact have a paper in science in 1976 where we showed that um, if you measure respiration, and you measure the hydrogen transfer pathway, you see no difference between these two cell types, even though glycolysis is different. So we said, what is different about them? And we showed that it was glucose transport. So the glucose transport was very high here. And then I did another crazy experiment. I brought the glucose transport to this level. The cells started acting like normal. I took the normal and increased the glucose, the sugar level, they started acting malignant. And I thought that was exciting. But these were chick embryo fibroblasts, and nobody was interested in glucose metabolism. I could have danced, I could have played the guitar, I could have jumped up and down, I could have done whatever. No, everybody in the audience would glaze, even more than you're doing now. So don't fall asleep on me. Okay. So, it took me 30 years to get one person in my lab, this wonderful Japanese guy, I don't know how they do this, but somehow they do this, uh, came to my lab and took all these arrays we had done when we reverted the cells, for example, using EGFR inhibitor, using beta-1 inhibitor, using PI3 kinase inhibitor, blah, 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 blah. He didn't do the arrays. He took the glycolytic intermediates and put them at one, and then looked at the malignant glycolytic intermediates and showed that they were always high in these T4 and S1, the, the, the two things together. Are you still with me? Yeah? Okay. So, the normal are here, the malignant are here. Let's look at that. So now we come and revert them and we ask what happens to these two, okay? They go down. We do another one they go down. We do another one, they go down. We do another one, they go down. You see, they just, this is all of them. So every time you revert the cells with beta-1 integrin, EGFR changes, PI3 kinase changes, what else changes? Glucose metabolites. So they're all integrated, right? And again, this doesn't happen in two dimension. It doesn't happen on tissue culture plastic. Only happens in three dimension, okay? So, this was quite exciting. So I said to, to, um, to Yasuhito, I said, geez, now let's do the experiment I did. Let's change the sugar. What happens if we take glucose away? And look, oh, it, that, that shows that TCA cycle is not affected. It's very similar to what we had shown. Okay, so here's an experiment. We did two deoxyglucose and we could show that we can revert the cells when we lower the glucose level. But here are the non-malignant cells at five different glucose concentration on top. Can you still see this? They all look gorgeous. Beautiful base cell polarity, small, looking like an asinus. Here are the malignant cells. At zero glucose, they look perfectly lovely and normal. 0.175, lovely and normal. 1.75, they start getting larger, 5.5 millimolar, which is the physiological glucose, they start messing up. And when at 17.5, which is what has Del Beco's medium, look at it. They are a mess. So sugar, increased sugar is an oncogenic molecule. Next time you have your second chocolate cake. <laughs> Remember this. Sugar is not good for you. Okay, all right, so we have cleaned this up. We know how this works. The, the receptor of sugar uptake talks to beta-1 integrin. Beta-1 integrin talks to EGFR. They all talk to each other. They have new pathways that connect them. We have discovered two new pathways where sugar uptake regulates beta-1 and EGFR, and beta-1 and EGFR regulate sugar uptake. Very exciting. So we haven't published it, we are about the revised manuscript I should be working on instead I'm talking to you. Okay, so, so we now put glucose level up here, okay? 
Now let's see. I am explaining too much and I'm afraid I'm running out of time. So the question then is, what actually, what is, the, what is it that messes up these cells? And what is it that we correct each time we reverse, right? So we have a paper in gene and development in December, for those of you who are interested. And what we show is that it is MMP9. Every time the cells lose, at least in this system, okay? Every time the cells get disorganized, MMP9 is up. So Alain, uh, who did this very nice experiment, Bellevue, Alain Bellevue, he made constructs where he could then conditionally express MMP9. And when he does that, we did mass spec and we showed what does MMP9 do? It destroys the laminin and destroys the basement membrane. It makes the structure go, the structure go, the cells are malignant. You put beta-1, inhibition, MMP9 goes down. You put EGFR, MMP9 goes down. You put low glucose, MMP9 goes down. It's a very lovely integrated unit, and we have 340-something molecules that we have identified out of 28,000, which are in common in all these reversion that we are now trying to find out how we could deal with them. So we have a whole, not, whole lot of new targets for, for looking at cancer treatment. Okay. We had a paper with Joe Gray and others showing that HER2 signaling response to, to drugs is different in 2D and 3D. And some of you may know that we, had, uh, we actually did an experiment in 2002 where we said, is this concept of three-dimensionality has anything to do with drug resistance, right? So does it have to do with drug resistance, this structural unit? So we took six different um, apoptotic agents. They all act by completely different mechanism. They have different mechanism. But we said, what happens if we put these cells in tissue culture plastic and add these six different agents either to normal and malignant? Well, when we do that, 2D, 2D, all six of them kill both normal and malignant cells. People who study drug resistance in 2D culture hardly ever use non-malignant cells, but if they did, they would kill them too, very often, okay? So we can show that, that they both get killed, so then we put them in 3D. When the, normal, uh, when the normal cells are in 3D, they get organized, and you remember tumor cells are malignant, so these now die, these don't, you see that? They don't when they are organized. And we say, oh, it finally has to do with the genome. Well, no. When we take the tumor cells and revert them, they don't die. I am not showing it to you. It's in the paper, in the cancer cell paper 2002. Is it growth? No. We can put them under condition in a different condition or do whatever. They don't, it has nothing to do with growth. It has to do with polarity. And it has to do with hemidesmosomes. And it has to do with the structure of hemidesmosome talking to extracellular matrix and basement membrane. So um, John Brugge, who is at Harvard, and Sentil Mutaswamy came to my lab, learned how to do this. We had a nice paper together in Nature Cell Biology, and then Joan's group did something in cell about the, the apoptosis in the center of these asini. And we had the paper in cancer cell, and Tyler Jacks and Bob Weinberg wrote a little commentary in cell. And um, this is what I like. All of a sudden, studying cancer cells in two dimension appears to be quaint, if not archaic. Now, you tell me who wrote this. Bob Weinberg writes so well. If you wrote your papers as well as he does, you would get it into cell and nature also. So learn how to write. So I was at Whitehead Institute, and I said, Bob was in the audience, and I said, Bob, I'm so glad you came around. We, um, you know, it's, it's such a pleasure, but I have one correction, is not all of a sudden. It took 30 years. So, <laughs> all right. So we even have used, as I told you, this logic of thinking in 3D. We have made a screen. I really don't have time to tell you about it because I really want to show. We have found a new molecule in the EGFR pathway that may explain resistance to EGFR inhibitors. 
is a new molecule. It's called FAM83A. We have a whole family of oncogenes, actually, we have discovered. These are the tumors. These are the normals. There is a huge amount of data. In the animals, uh, when you have a high level of this, the cells grow when you uh, inhibit. They don't grow, but here is the exciting thing. If you have too much of it and you give them lapatinib, the growth rate doesn't change, but they're resistant to lapatinib. So we are finding new drugs, new, new molecules that sh explain resistance to drug by thinking in three dimension. I wish I had time. This needs an hour by itself. So to conclude is that the 3D models of cancer are robust surrogates for breast cancer. And I like to say to you that everything I'm telling you about um, mammary gland is true for the brain, is true for the liver, is true whatever. But you have to make those tissue-specific models in order to find out how these pathways differ. Where does the tissue specificity come from, and where do these things go? Okay. I'm not going to have a chance at all to tell you about this. All I will tell you is that we made a mouse we put MMP3, which happens in involution, in the middle of pregnancy. We made it conditional. It came up, destroyed the basement membrane, and the animal got tumor, and the tumors were horrible. We published it in Cell in 1999. And the question was, is it MMP3 selecting already malignant cell, or is the destruction of the ECM molecule and the structure by itself is an oncogenic event? Right? Are you still with me? Okay. So when we did that experiment, we made it, we actually made a TET inducible MMP3. We have a paper in Nature in 2005 where we show, and I'm showing you only one slide, and when we actually turn on MMP3 and measure with paloassay the level of, of gene amplification and genomic instability, just the loss of the basement membrane by MMP3 causes genomic instability in a hurry. And here is fish. You see the cat locus is, gets amplified. And to, if I, I didn't even put the summary in for you, but we have a whole scheme, and you can look at it in the paper if you're interested. What happens is that the cells start making reactive oxygen species. They splice RAC differently. They make a thing called RAC1B that people had seen in tumors, but they didn't know that they are actually, uh, how is it produced? It produced because of the loss of a structure, and it goes very high on tumors, and if we put RAC1B in cells, we can bypass the MMP3 and we can get them malignant, and they also make a epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which is something we reported actually in 97 with these things. All right. We also have spent a lot of time, um, I don't want you to even look at that, just listen to me. So um, you heard that, that I came up with this model of dynamic reciprocity. In 1982, I had a theoretical paper, and I said that the outside, meaning the ECM, had to talk to the nucleus and to chromatin. It had to talk through receptors. In those days, people even didn't know um, integrins. This, I wrote it in 1979, but published it in January 82. It said, ECM talks to chromatin, reorganizes chromatin through cytoskeletal um, conduit between the receptor and the chromatin. The chromatin reorganizes, tells the cells outside what to do, and the cells outside do something else. I called it the model of dynamic reciprocity. You have 10 trillion cells at any time in your body, these cells are all talking to each other and moving around. Well, recently we asked the question of why is it that the cells become quiescent when we give the cells laminin? And how does laminin talk to growth regulation? Well, we have a paper in Journal of Cell Science at, in December also of this 2010, and this lovely girl did a lot of lovely work and what we show is that actin in the nucleus has a function in these cells, has a function in quiescence, and when we add laminin, actin exits the nucleus. Actin in the nucleus is talking to polymerase two, polymerase three, a whole lot of other things, and when you add laminin, through whatever pathway, part of which we know, is talking to the actin in nucleus. Actin has to go in order 
for the cells to become quiescent. And we show in the mammary gland that where actin is, laminin is not in the sections of the mammary gland. So laminin and actin behave differently at different parts of the mammary gland. And if you add laminin to cells in tissue culture, the way you can make them quiescent is by exit of the actin. So we made a construct of actin that would not allow the actin to get out of the nucleus. And when we did that, the cells wouldn't stop growing. Okay, very exciting. And we now have a whole lot of new data on how does that work with chromatin. And we also have a couple of paper in JVC and JCB showing that when you have the, oh, I have drawn it for you schematically, uh, when you have, say, things like a tissue-specific protein beta casein sitting on the, on the nuclear matrix, it doesn't fire. No matter what you would do, it doesn't express. You come in and you add a little bit of laminin, and when you do that, uh, Ren uh, Zhu, who had done the experiment, if you look up that paper in JCB in 2009, I guess, you see that the, uh, p uh, that the, that the um, promoter of the beta casein gets acetylated, CBP beta, STAT5, RNA PAL2, BERG1, this is for transcription factor, it's related to all the molecular biology you do, they all come together, they make a complex, and then the cell fires and then is now able to do that. But it first has to go into quiescence. So what laminin does is many different functions. It allows the cells to go into quiescence, and then it does this. Okay, so where do we go now? Now I'll try it to be as fast as I can. So we have made a model for metastasis. We spent 30 years working on model for tumor genicity. We learned a lot. But what kills you is metastasis, so we made a model for metastasis. We published this in Science, so I will tell you very, very quickly. We ask the following question. When, when uh, the girls get the hormones of puberty, the mammary gland on LAGO, which men also have, it starts invading into the fat pad. But it never, never violates the fat pad. So we said, what is it that tumor cells hijack? which allows them to invade because they get out of the fat pad, right? So we said, let's try and find this out. What makes them branch and what makes them invade? So this, uh, we wanted to make a very um, uh, high throughput model for metastasis or for invasion. And this lovely gal who is now a professor at Princeton who is a bioengineer made a micro pattern. She put one layer of collagen. She made a micro pattern. She put the cells in it, put another layer of collagen. And we had shown a long time ago that when you do that, the cells make a lumen. So she has hundreds and hundreds of these little tiny things with a little lumen inside. So she binarizes 50 of them so she can really learn this fast. I saw a lot of bioengineers I met at lunch, so I thought I better put that in. So <laughs> when you put 50 of these and you have a, um, a structure like that, even though the cells are everywhere, this, the branching comes only from the top and the bottom. Why? So we make a square, it comes from corners. We make a circle, it comes from everywhere. And the one that I really like is the Y. It comes from here and here and here. Now we were all going crazy. We didn't know what was going on. So I took her to a modeler, Dan Fletcher, a brilliant guy at Berkeley campus and he's very um, clever postdoc. And he said, model this for us. So they said, you have an endogenous inhibitor. And wherever that inhibitor gets secreted, the cells don't come out and branch, right? So we said, oh, I always thought you have to have an inducer. So we said, if you have one of these, you see this is where the inhibitor is, so the cells don't branch here and here. We said, let's test it. So if you put one next to the other like that, or put two of those, where it should, if, if they're right, where it should branch is here and here and here and here and here, right? Right? We did it, and they were right. And it worked, and we were happy, we celebrated. It was a very nice experiment because we, we did the experiment, they modeled it, we tested it, it was right. We popped a few bottles of champagne, we had a lot, and in about half an hour we got depressed. He said, what is the inhibitor? 
And that's the beauty of science, right? You answer one thing, then I know. So sometimes it's not bad to be old folks. So I uh, put my old hat on, and I remember that 30 years ago, somebody, um, Charles Daniel, did an experiment where he put a little LVAX pellet in the mammary gland of TGF beta. And he showed that it inhibited branching, but that was an exogenous factor. And I said, maybe the endogenous factor is TGF beta. So we did the experiment. We got all this stuff from Anita. There's a paper in Science in 2006 um, and is dedicated to Anita Roberts. So we did the experiment, dominant active, dominant negative, this, that, and they were absolutely right. And then we said, what actually correlates with where the cells start branching? And I had postulated that if this EMT had any reason to be good or relevant or physiologically relevant, it had to happen in vivo. And I said, if this invasion has any bearing, maybe there is a little, little tiny transient EMT at the tip of these branches, right? So we took the Vimentin promoter, attached it to GFP, and we said, does it turn on? It does turn on right where the branches occur. Quite exciting. And we now know what are the molecules that are responsible. And I think I said it already. I think you know, he did. Uh, Jeff Green, who's sitting there, did a part a sabbatical in Joe Gray and part in my lab, but you know what it is, right? You know what it is? Don't go and publish it. It's MMP14. <laughs> so, all right. So where do we go now? Where do we go from here? And I seem to have misplaced my, my, um, my uh, slide. Well, we have made, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to have time to tell you about this. I want to tell you about this one. So we published a paper in 2002 with Ole on bringing, because mammary gland is not just epithelial cells. You need myoepithelial cells, you need the stroma, you need the fat, you need endothelial cells, you need this, you need that. So we have now done epithelial and myoepithelial cells, and we can show that when you put myoepithelial cells on the top of the cells that are not doing the right thing, they actually will become polar in the correct way. I know I'm rushing, but if you're interested, send me a note or talk to me after, and I can tell you what we did. It was a really cute experiment. So we then uh, did an experiment, and we put endothelial cells on the top of the, of the chamber. We put epithelial cells on the bottom, and we, when the cells were malignant and disorganized, endothelial cells came down because epithelial cells were secreting VEGF. We published this in Cancer Research two years ago, and we showed that when we revert the malignant cells, then it doesn't signal to endothelial cells. So the architecture is talking to the surrounding tissue, right? So this new guy, Cyrus Rajar, a wonderful postdoc in my lab, here he is on the, on the site. He has made, he's making a model of, a beautiful model of dormancy based on our reversion model, because the reversion is a model for dormancy. We revert and these cells don't grow until something else happens. He's done it in vivo, I don't have time to explain to you, and we also have done it um, in culture. We have now made fantastic model in collaboration with Shaheen Rafi. We can make the cells grow on the top in a lung-like uh, microenvironment or in a bone marrow-like microenvironment, and we are asking the question, how do, they re how do they respond? If we put cells that are actually dormant, what actually will make them to wake up and do what they're supposed to do? Are you still with me? <laughs> okay. Now I'm going to wake you up. So, give me three minutes and I will tell you some of the things that absolutely boggles my mind. So I have this physicist who came to my lab and she is so intuitive, she's so incredibly good, I can't tell you. Her name is Candice. So she said, when you put the reverting agent in, you're putting it at a, cell, uh, at a single cell level and you're telling me that after 36 hours or 48 hours, you can't revert the cells anymore. So something really important is happening at the 36-hour level. What is it? I said, I don't know. 
You tell me. So she puts these cells in, in 3D, and she looks at what they do, and look what they do. They, they rotate and tumble around a single axis, and if you prevent them from tumbling, they won't form an asinus. It's exactly like an embryo. So here it is. If you, uh, let's see. So these are non-malignant cells. And now, come on, come on, come on. They're making the beautiful asana. Now. Now go. Let's see. OK. So over there are the normal cells. Here are the malignant cells. And we have labeled them with actin. And just watch how the actin it differs and how these cells have a different kind of achievement. Here are the normal. Here are the malignant. And I will describe to you what these are. Look at the way the malignants separate, and the normal are actually still attached. So we ask, even after you have formed the asinoid, are our cells moving? I know in vivo they are probably constrained by a whole lot of other things. Do they have a movement that actually tell them you're normal, you're malignant? And look at this. <laughs> That's the asinus. And this is just an aggregate of the same cells, and they are primary human breast. So cell lines do it, primary human cells do it. When you have an asinus, it has this very coherent adhesive movement, while the tumor cells act like that. And we ask the question, is it because they aggregate, and, or is it because they are tumor as opposed to a normal, and it's because they, they need to be an organized asinus to have that movement. So let me show you what she's done. So here are the malignant cells on the left. Here are the reverted cells. And the malignant cells separate and do this funny thing. And the, and the reverted cells slow down, stay together. And I wish I could show you all of the data. The paper just went to nature. They probably will kill us but it's a completely new movement we have discovered. Absolutely boggles my mind. And what it is is that in order for the cells to be able to actually talk to each other and be able to make an asinus, they have to have attachment. So the normal cells become two, tumor cells become two, but then the normal cells become three because the third one, it doesn't become four, just like a, just like a stem cell while the tumor cells, one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, the normal cells are always doing it when they're attached together. And that's the reason we, can, we, have, we have to do this at the early stage. By the time there are four cells, it's already too late because they have lost the attachment. Okay, is attachment important? She's modeled it, and it's actually quite lovely being a physicist. She can do these things. She has a model of how normal cells behave, tumor cells behave. She has model the spatiotemporal activity of the, of the dynamics of these cells. And we then said, OK, is polarity important? Here are the, are the control cells. Here are the cells into which we have inhibited PAR3, which is an important polarity control. And this is how she uh, follows the movement. And you see in the, in the non-malignant cells, the movement is very local. And when you mess up the polarity, it starts going like malignant cells. The same thing with adhesion. So when we do that with the uh, e cadherin here are the beautiful three-dimensional model of cadherin. Here we have inhibited cadherin, and here are the control, and here are these that completely lose this. And the interesting thing is she can now make different tissue likes by inhibiting different stuff. So the way that you're inhibiting the movement of these things can actually, I think she's going to figure out why your nose is your nose and the rest of it, but you need the laminin and you need the ECM. Okay, and we finally have a new technique that I wish I could talk to you about. We're just about to send that out. These are tissues that are not, um, that are not stained and we are able to really have resolution at the one cell stage using confocal microscope, and uh, we can reorganize mammary gland. And to summarize, it's really important to think about what it is that I have talked to you about. What is important is not mutation alone, 
it is not by chemical signaling alone, is not force and tension alone. They all work to each other, with each other. You can change the force, the biochemistry changes. You change the biochemistry, the force changes. And all of these are integrated within the structure. But is a combination, integration of mechanical, chemical, physical, and as yet unknown biological phenomenon. I want to stress that. There is so much we don't know. There is so much we don't know. There, there are biochemical integrator about which we know very little that make us who we are. And herein lies the challenge of tissue specificity and cancer. And the idea is how to prevent this integration of these exquisitely tuned principles. So this is the end of my talk. I have a number of you have seen this. Here is water coming into the shore from NASA satellite. Here is coral, and here is a mammary gland, whole mount. Do they look the same? Do they look similar? Why is it that nature does this over and over and over again? And I'd like to submit to you that we know everything about human genome. We know everything about the sequence of the genome. We know the language of the genome. We know the alphabet of the genome. We know nothing but nothing about the language of form. It's a whole wonderful new horizon for the young and the passionate old. That's me, right? So go to it. There is a lot to be discovered, and trust yourselves. Don't pay attention to all the arrogant people who think they know. The minute they think they know everything, they're not doing good science. They won't give you money. They didn't give me money for 20 years. I couldn't get money from NIH once I mentioned it. <laughs> I, said, I said Harold was in the audience. He, he didn't talk to me for about 10 years. So, but, but it was the truth. I said, you know, they, they anyway, OK. <laughs> so, they now give me a lot of money. <laughs> I have a merit at my age from NIH. I have two innovators of art. I have this, I have that. They could have given me some money 20 years ago. I would have loved it. <laughs> Don't give up. You have only one life. Do something good with it. Stick with it. Trust yourself. Look at yourselves and don't read the textbooks. They are only dead facts. Everybody tries to reclone themselves. Don't do that. When your experiment doesn't work, if it reproducibly doesn't work, get happy rather than unhappy. Say, what does it mean? I thought it was this. Oh, it may be that. It's fun. That's why science is fun. So this is my favorite cartoon, right? <laughs> so I used, to be the, I used to be the cat, and this was the authorities. Michael can tell you. They thought I was nuts in the study sections. They said, who is she? She doesn't. You know, and I would say, why are you funding this thing? It's such a bad grant. Anyway, the problem is I have become the authority now. So don't listen to me either. I have no idea if I'm right or not, but it has been a wonderful journey. This is my group. There's my physicist. She's from Trinidad. And it just, it's absolutely, she is one of my two top postdocs. And I have trained so many. You know, I have trained so many graduate students, postdocs. She's brilliant. And again, it has to do with context. As I said to the kids, she had two engineer parents. And from the day she was born, they said, you're going to be a physicist, you're going to be a physicist. They sent her to all these good schools. And boy, is she brilliant. She's, she's also intuitive. It absolutely boggles my mind. And I came back from <laughs> three, uh, sabbatical after three months, and eight of the couples in my lab had babies, so they made me. So, you know, people are always asking, <laughs> all right, and this is Lawrence Berkeley Lab. How many of you have seen my last joke? Let me have a show of hands. Not very many. OK, you can close your eyes. All right, I show this because to this day, people mix up Lawrence Berkeley Lab with Lawrence Livermore. Don't mix us up. 
we are the first national lab that existed. We have this beautiful view of Golden Gate Bridge. Livermore doesn't. They, they do defense-related stuff we don't. They are fine, but they are not Lawrence Berkey Lab, okay? This is an amazingly wonderful laboratory where they had they unleashed the first atom bomb by Lawrence. I mean, at, they smashed the first atom. And this dome was on the top of where the cyclotron was. And now we have synchrotron radiation for a structural biologist, and they kept the dome. And uh, I like to say to people, what does this remind you of? Does it remind you of a breast? Yeah? Now, when you, think, when, when you think of it, you'll never mix us up with Livermore again. Thank you very much. These are my funders. <laughs> I'm happy to answer questions if you still have the energy. <laughs> questions? <laughs> questions? I saw that you were going to give me something. <laughs> no, I'm just going to, to protect you in case. <laughs> questions? Yes, madam. Beautiful, beautiful, thought-provoking talk. Thank you. Talk. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there is a lot to ask, but I you can ask it when we go have uh, right, into reception. Right. So ask but one. Just I, I ask one, maybe a combination of one. Uh, you mentioned uh, that the tumor injected into the developmental um, uh, embryos, they they don't grow. Uh, could it be because that they are in the log phase of yep. growing, and there is not much inflammation induced. Oh, oh good for you. Induced. Okay. All right. No, well, let me tell you why that is. Okay. So we ask the question about why is it that embryo doesn't do it and chicken does it? Okay. So we then looked at the chicken and said, even the chicken, when you inject the tumor, you get a large tumor, and it grows and grows and kills the chicken. But the rest of the chicken doesn't get tumors. And we said, is it because the virus is not circulating? So we measured. I called up all the virologists. I said, what happens in the chicken? They didn't know. They worked on chicken embryo fibroblasts, right? So we measured, and there was a lot of virus running around. So clearly, the virus was there, but the tumor wasn't. So we said, even in the chicken, this is funny. What do we do when we inject the virus? We make a wound. Yes. So we made a tumor, then we made a wound here, and there came a huge tumor. And I like to say to people, this is the kind of experiment you can do in a village in Iran. You can yes. have a, in a syringe, a little bit of RSV, and a chicken. You don't need fancy stuff. It was absolutely amazing. So it said wounding was a co-carcinogen for yes. RSV. Wounding in the embryo, you're very perceptive. Wounding in the embryo is healed very differently than wounding in the chicken. Right. And, and, and we know that, and it's a different kind of TGF beta that are involved, right? So we then went and said, what is in wounding that does it? It was TGF beta. Right. So we wrote a paper in Science in 1990, and we were the first people who said TGF beta could have two different functions. In the normal, as you saw with my branching, it stops the growth. Mm -hmm. But if the cells are already initiated with a virus or a tumor promoter or whatever, now the TGF beta makes them go faster. And this is what people already, you know, they're the two sides of TGF beta. And at that time, Michael Sporn, who was here, I got some antibody from him, and I put his name on my paper. He called up my graduate student and nearly killed him. And he said, what do you mean? This is nonsense. We are going to be put in TGF beta, blah, blah, blah. So I called him up, and I said, Michael, you gave me some antibody. I was nice enough to put your name on the paper. So either take your name off or give me a different explanation. <laughs> and Michael didn't do either, and he's become a good friend. So, so clearly, TGF beta had two different functions. And that was, again, another one of those things which went against dogma even then, but now everybody's working on it, right? 
So you're absolutely right. Don't ask another question. Okay. And we can, <laughs> we can talk outside. Any other questions that you guys have to ask? If you don't, come outside and ask me Nina, if you're I a, shy. I have a question. Yes, sir. So you started out by telling us that, uh, by asking the question about why cancer was not more common. Mm -hmm. um, and then you showed us how fragile the phenotype was of cancer, at least in the model that you're looking at. What the, do you mean, how fragile? Meaning well, is reversible. How, are there how many plastic. ways you can, many ways you can reverse to, it? Yes. So the question is, why is cancer so difficult to treat, um, or are we just barking up the wrong tree? Well, that's a very good question. So you see, what what our data shows is that at the earliest stages of cancer, before it starts metastasizing. There are many ways that we can make a tumor a tumor, but it also means that there are many ways that we can stop from a tumor from pro progressing. And what I argue in that article, and we have table after table of things, is that the reason we don't get tumors, at least overt tumors, and we know that there are a lot of occult tumors in vivo, but they don't progress, right? I mean, we have all these DCIS, and we have no idea how many of them actually do this. If they section my breast right now, they'll find hyperplasia, they'll find ATPA, they, will, they may even see carcinoma in situ, they may even see tumors. They have tumors in, in prostate in 16-year-old boys, but it doesn't uh, express itself until they're 70 or they're 60. So why? And I argue that is the effect of microenvironment, because any one of these things exerting, you know, including the right kind of basement membrane, the right kind of stroma. But once it starts going, it changes the microenvironment. And the micro, and, and, the, and remember our data with the mouse says that the change in microenvironment by itself could be an oncogenic event. Because the MMP3, which actually goes up in the stroma, before we see the tumors by itself causes genomic instability. So once it starts going, it's a whole system that is messed up. So that's why the title of my talk today still makes sense. Because if we, under this condition, if we just treat the tumor, we can keep it for a little short time, but something else will go, right? So we need to be treating at least with two, three, or four different agents to be able to keep the tumor in check. And then if we could treat the inflammation, or a whole lot of other things that have messed up the whole surrounding of the tumor. And as you know, it, we now know that immune cells are involved, we know that, that uh, wounding is involved, we know that uh, messed up matrix is involved. So you need to use a combinatorial situation in vivo once the cancer goes a little bit farther, which is when we discover it. If we discover it early, I would argue that we can keep the tumor as a perfectly chronic disease. We can't cure cancer. We can't, no, we could cure cancer. We can't stop us from getting cancer. It's like aging. We haven't figured out how to deal with aging. All these wrinkles that I have, once they happen, they start giving the wrong signals to the cells, and sooner or later, they lose the structure. If we can prevent them before the structure is gone, then we can keep it as a, as a chronic disease. So, and, and I think there is good reason to actually hope for this coming up because I think we are going to have imaging technologies where we can distinguish things in vivo, hopefully, and distinguish why some things would go and some other things would not go. So I'm hopeful. It's a hopeful view of cancer, I must say. Okay, okay well, guys, thank you. Let's thank Dr. Bissell for an inspiring talk. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to say that we do want our scientists to think out of the box, and my job is to hold the scoop if necessary. He's, he's going to give you money if you think in three dimensions. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of scooping <laughs> outside the box.